Sounds good. Hello and welcome to The Periphery. I'm your host, Alan Elrod, and today's guest I'm excited about, it's uh, Matt McManus. Matt is a lecturer uh, in political science at the University of Michigan. He's also the author of The Emergence of Postmodernity and Liberalism and Liberal Rights, A Critical Legal Argument, amongst other books. Uh, his forthcoming work includes an essay collection on Nietzsche and the Politics of Reaction for Palgrave Macmillan and the Political Right and Equality for Rutledge Press. He is also someone you can find all across the internet if you're interested in him. He's written from for websites from Arc Digital to Liberal Currents to Jacobin. Uh, he's he's an interesting, provocative thinker, and we're going to get into some uh, I think really fun conversations today about just where political thinking is at uh, in this current moment in American in American political life. So Matt, um, I think probably one of the best things for people listening to understand is you describe yourself as a liberal democratic socialist, mm -hmm. uh, which is a set of words that maybe some people uh, could use, I think, uh, uh, some excavation in terms of how you see that all working together. So I thought I'd just give you a chance to lay out sort of how your political thinking operates, and then we can dig into some different stuff, um, some topical things and some other things in terms of uh, uh, how you kind of assess uh, our current moment. Yeah, no problem. Uh, well, thanks a lot for having me on this. Um, I appreciate it. I also just wanted to say that uh, calling a Canadian provocative uh, is one of the most like damning things you can possibly say about us. So like the little tiny patriot in me just died a little bit because of this, but still, it's kind of cool. Appreciate it. Um, anyway, um, yeah, I, I get a lot of questions about that. And I understand why, particularly in American context, this idea of a kind of liberal socialism might seem a little bit like an oxymoron, but actually it's a tradition with very deep roots uh, in many other parts of the world. So the example that I usually give theoretically uh, is John Stuart Mill, right? John Stuart Mill, emblematic liberal, if anybody ever happened to be, uh, author of On Liberty, cited by libertarians, also characterized himself as a socialist uh, very, very explicitly in his biography. Now, that's not me reading into it either. He said, I am decidedly classed under the designation of socialist. And there was a good reason for this, right? Because he argued in his chapters on socialism and various other texts that if you're genuinely committed to liberal principles like freedom and equality for all, there was something deeply skewed uh, about allowing domination by capitalism or by capitalists. Uh, now, this didn't mean that he thought that markets were a bad thing, just that markets didn't need to rely on private ownership of the means of production by capital or private management of the means of production by capitalists. Uh, and so what he argued for was a kind of worker-owned market socialism of the sort that I think is really appealing. So that's a theoretical point that I'd like to make. Uh, the more general point that I'd like to make is that many of the socialist parties in Western Europe, for example, or even my own country of Canada, uh, have done a really good job of integrating respect for liberal rights. In fact, a very expansive conception of liberal rights with this argument for economic equality and ensuring the flourishing of the least well off. Uh, and you can think about things like the Labour Party in the United Kingdom, the New Democratic Party uh, in Canada, uh, or for that matter, uh, the SPD, the kind of quintessential uh, socialist or social democratic party in Germany, right? Uh, and I think it's time that we start to experiment with that in the United States. And it's one of the reasons I look at somebody like Bernie Sanders as a potentially uh, good harbinger of things to come. Uh, and I've been doing my best to try to point out that there's an American homegrown tradition uh, of liberal socialism as well, which we can talk about a little bit later if you want. I think that's a very good um, initial laying out of, of the space you think in. And one of the things I, I find compelling um, when I've read or, or listened to you about the way you you describe this in the in the way you operate is that I think it gets at something which which I am also a little preoccupied with. I mean, I don't, we don't make any bones at Pulaski about having a whole lot of of, of liberalism um, infused in our um, thinking. And I mean that in that kind of big tent philosophical tradition way that that you're also getting at. Um, and I think I think a lot of what you're uh, also getting at is this idea of the 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 tradition within liberalism itself, uh, which is preoccupied with human freedom, has in a lot of ways 
uh, in in the 21st century, in, in the middle and late 20th century, particularly in America, become exceedingly restricted to a, a few different sort of spheres of, of life. And that we don't think hard enough or rigorously enough, or or even I think, I hope you would agree with this, creatively enough yep. about human freedom and what it means to be free and what freedom looks like and, and what those questions ask of us uh, in, a, in a, in a quote, liberal democracy. Cause that's the other thing, right? I also know that for you, you know, the democracy part is, is essential, right? We're, we're not trying to achieve gains for people or, or a better political system uh, outside of, of democratic processes. We want to do it in them, but that means trying to think in a way that is both um, inventive, but also attractive to people about how freedom operates and the reason I think this is so compelling is because one of the really big concerns I have, I think, in, in the moment we're currently living in is how many of the people um, that I'm most concerned by, right, and, and I'm, I'm particularly interested to pick your brain on some of these, these people, these sort of self-styled post-liberals like Patrick Deneen and, and Gladden Pappen, have come along and said pretty unabashedly, uh, no, actually – um, it's fine to use state control. It's fine to be coercive. Huh. It's fine to be, uh, you know, and this is a break with at least uh, on the on the surface level, right? At least ostensibly a break with the sort of Reagan, right? We could we could pick at how much is break continuity, but uh, you know, no, actually, it's fine to use power this way. And the reason I think that this to bring this all together and put it to you, the reason I think this is such an important moment is. What kind of worries me about these guys is as much as I personally find their thinking repellent, they also do seem to be putting a whole lot of, of time and energy. There seems to be a lot on this side, unfortunately, of creative energy. And oh, yes. one of the things that concerns me is the lethargy that seems to have overtaken a lot of traditional liberal thought and the need for us to find a way to reinvigorate our own thinking about freedom. So I'm curious – how you feel are you are you as worried about where sort of thinking about freedom and liberalism uh is right now as, as i kind of am which is that it, it it's not as energized i think as it should be and then also i want to after that kind of deviate into these 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 kind of new guard post-liberal rightist thinkers like like Deneen and Pappen and, and the kind of challenge they're presenting yeah absolutely uh so Corey Robin uh, blurb Sam Moyne's new book on liberalism since the Cold War, uh, and he pretty much captured the way a lot of us felt uh, as kind of young leftists growing up uh, in the early 21st century when it came to liberalism, where he said, you know, I thought of liberals as cowardly technocratic centrists. Uh, and to a certain extent, he was right, right? If you think about the way that liberalism came to be embodied by people like Tony Blair or Bill Clinton, uh, all of whom conceded so much to the political right, it's very easy to get this idea that liberalism just stands for this ooey-gooey, uh, non-principled kind of approach to the world that has nothing inspiring to offer people, particularly those who don't think that the status quo uh, is really up to par. Uh, and this creates a serious opening for exactly the kind of figures that you're talking about, like Pat Deneen, Adrian Vimuli, because they can channel the resentments of people towards just that kind of technocratic liberalism and say, yeah, you are right to feel angry about that. But what we want is a more authoritarian, illiberal solution. And part of what I'm doing is by trying to show is trying to show how there is a lot of creative, radical energy within the liberal tradition and indeed the socialist tradition. Uh, and there's no need for us to cede the term uh, to these kind of technocratic centrist um the cliches, if you want to put it that way, right? Um, and so I'll give two examples of just what I'm talking about when it comes to kind of a radical liberalism. Uh, so take, for instance, John Rawls, right? John Rawls is pretty much the quintessential American philosopher. He was actually read for a very long time as embodying just this kind of technocratic centrist uh, kind of philosophy. But in fact, if you read his later works, what's really interesting about this is he expressly declares that even welfare statism is not sufficient to embody the principles of liberal justice. Uh, what we need to do is move towards property-owning democracy, or what he expressly calls liberal socialism. Uh, and that's the only kind of adequate liberal society from a Rawlsian perspective. And there are a lot of different arguments he gives from this, but one that I think is particularly compelling in our contemporary moment is he talks about how 
vast inequalities in wealth lead to vast inequalities in political power, which means that some people in American society come to enjoy vastly greater value when it comes to the exercise of their political liberties than others. Uh, and this isn't just a theoretical point. I think that's exactly what we've seen, certainly in the last 20 years. If you think about decisions like Citizens United, for example, uh, which license corporations to spend vast sums of money in order to influence elections, uh, or you think about empirical research like Martin Gillen's, uh, where he pointed out that the average American citizen has almost no impact on U.S. policy, uh, but affluent U.S. citizens have an incredible amount of influence on the makeup of U.S. policy. It's very likely that their policy preferences are, will be selected uh, by their representatives, right? So that brings to the mind a lot of these kind of Rawlsian concerns about equal value of political liberties, since we are nominally supposed to be equal citizens, but right now it's clear that we're not. And a kind of liberal socialism a la Rawls can be an answer to that. Another theorist that I think is doing really exciting work in the liberal tradition that very much speaks to our contemporary moment uh, is Elizabeth Anderson, uh, who's also at the University of Michigan. Uh, and, you know, it's just doing fantastic work on what she calls private government. Uh, and one of the things that she points out is that historically liberals, particularly in the United States, as I mentioned, that's less true elsewhere, focus a lot on the potential of despotism coming from the state. Uh, now, this is obviously something that anyone should be concerned with, right? particularly a liberal. Uh, but she points out that most of us actually don't spend a, a lot of time every day interacting with state officials uh, or state institutions. Our everyday interactions are defined by our relationship with another kind of corporation or institution, uh, our jobs, right, or our employers. Uh, and this is what she calls private government. And she points out that we are willing to accept all kinds of restrictions on our freedom when we enter the private sphere to go to our job that we would never, ever accept uh, as liberals coming from the state. Uh, think about what your boss can now tell you to do. He can tell you when you can go to the washroom. He can put pressure on you to decide when it is that you're going to have children. Uh, he or she can put pressure on you to post certain things on social media or not. Uh, they can be rest pose restraints upon your schedule. They can call you any time of day. Uh, they can do that annoying thing of telling you, you know, yes, I understand that these are your working hours, but don't you want to show that you're really enthusiastic uh, about this position? Because if you aren't, you know, there are other people who might be really enthusiastic, right? Uh, and that's if you're at a white collar job. If you're working for a place like Amazon, things get vastly worse, right? When you think that these are people who are quite literally... <laughs> quite literally enduring serious medical problems as a result of the literally backbreaking labor that they have to do in order to make sure that most of us can get our packages on time. So Anderson says, if you are genuinely committed to the liberal principles of freedom and equality, uh, let alone concern for the dignity of each person, why not interrogate private government and the forms of domination that are operative within it? Why is it that the 8, 10, 12 hours a day that you spend, that you spend at the workplace is suddenly just exempted from these kind of liberal considerations. And I think that that's something that we really should be asking ourselves at this moment. Uh, and I think that there are a lot of good resources that the socialist tradition, for instance, provides that can help liberals as they struggle, particularly in the United States, to try to interrogate the forms of domination and unfreedom that exist within the workplace. So those are two examples of political theorists in an American context that align with the liberal tradition, uh, but have started to teach us how to think very seriously about contemporary problems in an American setting. That is exactly what I think we need to do if we're to resuscitate liberalism for a new generation and allow it to be competitive uh, with these increasingly creative reactionaries. And I think what's really interesting to me as you're laying all of that out, and I find it incredibly compelling and 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 also agree that we're going to, you know, just a willingness to come back and reassess the status quo of our relationship to these institutions is essential for, I think, political life to stay vibrant. And, um, but one of the things that occurs to me that's really weird about the moment we're living in, right, is uh, those of us who who come more from somewhere left of center, however, whether that's far away from the center or or somewhat closer. I think generally still feel like the conversations about how we regulate industry, how we approach um, the relationship between the industry and, 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 and corporations and their employees uh, and the idea that there's a space for, for public debate about how to um, 
protect right employees and 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 consumers and not only those people but but just generally um community life from from certain aspects of market activity is i think a little more intuitive what's interesting to me in a lot of this and i'm curious for your thoughts on it is this rising willingness um not premised on on the things you just laid out which has to do with like uh uh um, the right and uh, to a certain degree of of freedom from your job and and uh, enjoying uh, a, a, a quality of life without you know working you know 50 60 hours a week and and what it means to be free from a certain kind of like encroaching um demand for your time from your employer rather than those things is kind of on the right this new willingness right to challenge corporations over cultural issues right mm-hmm. Um, both both authoritatively from the state, right, in terms of like what what Ron DeSantis is doing and sort of his weird uh, locking of horns with Disney, and then also um, in a more bottom up sense with these kinds of boycott movements over things like Bud Light, you know, doing the advertisement with a with a, a, a transgender spokesperson. Uh, I'm curious what you think about this new this new bubbling up of willingness to to try to confront and not only confront but also coerce business and market forces and institutions on the right, largely in the name of culture. Yeah, that's a fascinating question, uh, and it's one that we could devote a whole episode to. Uh, I just want to say uh, from the beginning, uh, I think that it's long overdue uh, for American conservatives to take these kind of problems seriously. Uh, and that this hasn't been an issue for conservatives elsewhere in the world, uh, many of who have been very hostile to markets for a wide variety of reasons, including the ones that American conservatives are just waking up to. Uh, the reason I say this is I have a new book coming out on the political right uh, this summer, and I address this quite extensively. Right. Uh, but in terms of American conservatives, I think that anybody who buys into this notion that the political right in this country is going to be the one to check uh, the excesses of private power is betting on the wrong horse. Uh, Now, let's just use DeSantis as an example, and then I'll move on to talking about Pat Deneen's new book. So Ron DeSantis does absolutely chastise American conservatives for not taking concentrations of what he calls private power seriously. Uh, And he says that we need to do that as conservatives and use the state uh, in order to check private power. Now, if you are a leftist, you might think, hey, that sounds slightly appealing. Uh, But he makes it very clear that the reason he wants to check private power is exclusively for these cultural reasons, right, Uh, to inhibit corporations from spreading woke ideology, leftist ideology, progressive ideology, cultural Marxism. I mean, there's so many synonyms at this point. Who even knows any longer? Right. Uh, But he has no problem, for instance, uh, when it comes to fifteen dollars an hour being proposed in Florida as the minimum wage, saying, no, 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 it's not time for that yet. Right. Uh, Or having extraordinarily negative things to say about unionization. Uh, That's DeSantis for you. Right. So this concern with private power isn't actually a concern with the domination enacted by private power or the material impacts that domination by private power has on work, the workplace. Uh, It's a concern that there are too many gay gay Disney characters out there right now uh, and the state can intervene in order to prevent that. Uh, But if you're an oil baron, uh, somebody that. DeSantis has a lot of praise for in this book, in his book, uh, then it's a okay uh, to exploit the earth, exploit your workers, whatever it is that you need to do in order to make a buck, right? Uh, so are these really the people that we think are going to be sticking up for the tangible interests of blue collar workers? I don't think so, right? Uh, now, Patrick Deneen, um, who I, I've written a review of his new book, Regime Change, and I want to point out is a very serious intellectual. Uh, I would actually argue you since the passing of Roger Scruton, the greatest conservative intellectual living right now. Uh, But I also point out that I am very skeptical uh, that the regime change to a post-liberal future that he's proposing will actually do all that much for workers, right? Now, I don't want to spoil my review too much because uh, my poor people, uh, but the book kind of opens with this somewhat compelling argument that what we want is a kind of synthesis of left to right or an alliance between left and right committed to left-wing economics and right-wing social policies uh, that can be appealing, again, uh, on a surface level, not to me, but certainly to some progressives I know who are just like no liberalism at any cost, right? Uh, But let's look at the left-wing economic proposals that he puts forward, right? There's no universal Medicare for all, uh, which would be 
not even a radical argument that would just bring the United States to a kind of standard social democratic level on par uh, with most developed states, right? Uh, there's no universal post-secondary education for all, no universal dare care for all, no concern uh, with reinvigorating the labor movement or increasing union density. Uh, there's not even all that much concern uh, with environmental issues, right? Uh, beyond a couple of aesthetic comments about how our cities have become ugly, right? Uh, Deneen's radical proposals include uh, we should try to provide jobs for everybody whenever possible. Uh, there should be People should have enough money on one wage to support a family, which is slightly good. And we should try to increase the social capital of workers, uh, but only their social capital, because he makes it very clear that he does not support economic redistribution uh, or any kind of measures that are intended to achieve economic equality. Right. So these don't sound like very left wing economic measures to me. Uh, as I point out in my review, it sounds like what Deneen is nostalgic for is just a return to the economics of the fucking Eisenhower administration, uh, but with less union density. Right. So not even that. Right. Uh, and for those of us who remember the Eisenhower administration, uh, that basically means we want to return to the world's most pitiful welfare state. Right. Uh, one that was, you know, the the runt of every other welfare state around the globe uh, in the 1950s. That's not left-wing economics, right? Uh, that would barely put you in the moderate center of the Democratic Party at this point, uh, let alone where Bernie Sanders is. <laughs> and there are plenty of space, there's plenty of space to the left of people like Bernie Sanders, right? So I'm very skeptical uh, that what Deneen is putting forward is actually something that will be to the benefit of the least well-off in this country or blue-collar workers uh, or white-collar workers for that matter, generally. Uh, I think that there's a way better deal that we can get uh, and that doesn't have to come at the price of ceding our foundation, fundamental liberal rights to what Deneen himself calls a new route that's going to take the place of the neoliberal aristocracy that governs us right now, which is another point, right? Uh, my response is also just to say, do we need an aristocracy at all? <laughs> Can't we just imagine a world where there aren't, you know, hoity-toity people uh, mouthing Berkey and or high team platitudes ruling over us? I think that there could be. I mean, this is where I think that the the right the like the way you can't the way the way any kind of attempt to sort of you know front uh, what Deneen or, or Papin are doing as in any way kind of sticking it to to sort of um, entrenched powers doesn't work for me. Right, as like you just said, there there is still this fundamental uh, tradition they're coming from where. Hierarchy is good, and the wheeling of of hierarchical right authority uh, to kind of get what you want and and order society how you please that's also good, right? These guys are not really. I don't think they're populists, uh, and I think that the people who to view them in that way, or at least you know, at, um, as as concerned with sort of popular sovereignty, are are wrong, um, or at least are letting them brand themselves in a way that I think is at least a little dishonest. Um, and this gets into, right, some of the, I, you know, I listened to um, in, in, and thought it was just amazing. And, you know, maybe it's not great to plug someone else's podcast on your own, but when, <laughs> uh, when you went on uh, Sean Elling's Great Zone podcast and talked oh, yeah. about Nietzsche, it's such a good conversation. And I can't help at this point, but think about it, right? Because we're talking about how we think about uh, power and who should get to wield it, and uh, how we think about hierarchy in society. And liberalism, right, fundamentally across its various uh, iterations says, well, people are supposed to be uh, equal and, and the same. And, and what you have, and, and I think we are, and then this is why I think it's also important that you, you, you disagree with Deneen, but you recognize, I think, appropriately the heft of what he's bringing to the table because it is it is hefty yeah. um, and i think that's important because these guys are coming along at another moment not honestly so unlike the nietzschean moment where a lot of things are in disruption a lot of things are in flux there is a lot of dissatisfaction a lot of what uh, <laughs> the kind of old gods of certain kind of political thought and, and status quo assumptions seem to be uh, in a state of of dissolution, and putting forward a, a a a series of propositions, and we have to we have to really entangle 
uh, ourselves in them and really wrestle with them seriously. I think that's another thing that worries me. You know, I, there's a lot of I'm perfectly fine with a certain degree of dunking on some of these guys sometimes, right? Because because that can be an effective way of engagement at times. But I also appreciate your willingness to take them seriously, and I'm curious how you feel about that kind of linkage between those conversations. Of, of I do think we're in a moment where. Um, I, I don't know that these guys would would object to the idea that they are they are coming along, not unlike uh, their own in a way that's not unlike their own kind of Nietzsche moment of pro- proposing a that 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 a certain world that we used to live in has passed, and that they are uh, envisioning something new. Absolutely, and I think that's an extremely important for leftists uh, like myself to understand that we haven't really understood uh, as maybe as well as we should have, right? Uh, so there's a couple of things that I want to say about this. Uh, the first off is um, I think it's perfectly acceptable to dunk on the more crass uh, figures uh, and arguments put forward by the conservative movement. And Lord knows I've done plenty of that myself, right? Um, you know, if I have one more nasty thing to say about Levin's American Marxism, then, you know, <laughs> he's probably going to come after me with a shotgun because I've just been so mean to him. But it's a really fucking terrible book, right? I don't even want to call it a book because it's more just a collection of quotes that he stapled together or probably his secretary stapled together, right? Uh, and I think that pricking the pretensions of like crass and lazy conservatives is an important thing for progressives to do, uh, certainly to kind of deflect from the cultural power that they're trying to assume for themselves. But there is a very serious conservative intellectual tradition that you can't approach in this way. Uh, And Corey Robin made this point very nicely in his book, The Reactionary Mind, uh, where he points out that there's this kind of operative assumption in the the work of even smart leftist commentators on the right, uh, that conservatism is just a matter of the gut rather than the head. Uh, Now, Robin points out that conservatives themselves have sometimes leaned into this more than they should, uh, including people like Russell Kirk, for example, who described conservatism as less a kind of intellectual or theoretical program and more a disposition uh, that one one starts with. Um, But once you look at the panorama of right wing thinkers, it includes some very significant uh, philosophers, theorists, political economists, you name it. Right. Uh, And the left has to become more adept at responding to these kinds of individuals. Uh, Now, my own book uh, covers the kind of panorama of right-wing thought from Aristotle through Carlyle, through Nietzsche and Dostoevsky, uh, down to, you know, people like Deneen, Hazoni, uh, and others. Uh, But, you know, there's a lot of stuff that's missing, and I'm hoping that there'll be more progressive authors that will come to the fore that will look at the right seriously and try to offer considered and sustained objections uh, to their basic proposals, right? Now, in terms of the post-liberal moment that we live in, uh, I think it's absolutely the case that Deneen, Vermeule, Hazoni uh, see this as a kind of context uh, where there's an open-mindedness uh, towards and receptivity towards those ideas that there wouldn't have been, say, 20, 25 years ago. Uh, And I think that they are right to feel that way, uh, because we have seen that many people, including many young people, gravitate towards things like post-liberalism or nationalism as a kind of vehicle to articulate their resentments and anger at the neoliberal status quo. Uh, Now, while I understand pathologically and politically why people are doing that, I think it's ultimately misguided and it is not going to give them the outcomes that they want for all the reasons that I mentioned before and many more. Uh, But we at the left have to be better at understanding the right so we can grasp its appeal, counter it, uh, and try to put forward a more attractive and appealing egalitarian alternative to what they're going to be offering. And I think that we're doing a better job of it uh, than we were 10 years ago, but we will still be doing a lot more. This this reminds me, I mean, you know, sort of personal confession time, which is um, I, I would have styled myself through a significant period in my twenties as a as a Marxist. I don't consider myself one now. And uh, but uh, for me in grad school, the most um, and I and I've I've moved away a little bit from certain uh, uh, more more leftist positions on some things, and 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 that's a that's a different kind of conversation. But um, one of the thinkers that. Even as I moved away from that, even as I drifted into uh, other other kinds of of lanes, and even as I I, I stopped being perhaps as as aligned with with some of uh, what I had 
had in the past when it came to uh, a kind of Marxist left um, is the amount of time in grad school I spent reading um, Antonio Gramsci. Uh, And by the way, um, was such a wonderful, weird revelation when I was uh, watching Pete Buttigieg campaign, right? And realizing that, oh, I'd just used his dad's translation for like all of my uh, master's level. Uh, Funny that, eh? <laughs> yeah. Um, and, if, you know, um, I think I think the reason why he sticks with me, though, is this this fundamental understanding that that anyone who, you know, and it doesn't even, you know, anyone who thinks seriously about political um and economic policy has to also think seriously about culture that politics has a bedrock layer and to me this gets at what we, we were saying earlier about this this notion of conservatism comes from the gut right and like yeah i think that that uh, if we if we think that way too often allows us to elide the the serious intellectual half of people like like Deneen. but at the same time the idea that that all politics does have this kind of uh, rootedness in sort of folkways and popular culture and um, the way people on a sort of daily basis uh, imagine their lives and think about um, the world around them is to me such a fundamental proposition um, I, 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 it, it never really left me. I was like, okay, you know, whatever else I think I've gained from some of this, that insight seems to me to be so fundamental. And I think this is something that a lot of people, and you can, you can say this about straight in the center liberals who, who have been labeled as sort of technocrats. You can say it's all the way out to the far left and, and people who are working in the, in, in the um, intellectual minds of, of, uh, historical materialism that there's often sometimes a a lack of attention to that kind of bedrock culture level thinking uh, in terms of how political change is achieved, how political persuasion occurs, how one's ideas are presented to the world, uh, and I'm curious about it because I I find like I've just never been able to shake that particular. Uh, a bit of influence from from spending all that time in in sort of Gramsci's view of the world. Yeah, I think that's absolutely correct. Right now, I think there's a lot to be said about this. Uh, so I'll mince it piece by piece. Uh, now, I have a lot of sympathy for many elements of Marxism, um, particularly Marxist political economy and Marxist epistemology. But I do think it is absolutely the case that a kind of vulgar Marxism or economistic Marxism. Uh, was very much ascendant uh, through much of the 20th century and has continued to stamp the left in certain kind of negative ways, right? Uh, In the sense that there is a certain kind of leftist who thinks that the only thing that we really should be focusing on are bread and butter issues. Uh, There's no point in engaging in intellectual uh, deliberation or intellectual critique uh, because that's merely a superstructural concern, right? It's not really getting at the heart of what politics is about. Uh, And I don't think that that's true, right? Uh, I think it is absolutely the case that we need to engage in wars of uh, strategic position uh, or conflicts of strategic position at every level conceivable, right? Uh, Now, that means arguing, of course, for bread and butter issues, but it also means trying to create popular iterations of our ideas so that they are of interest uh, to a wide audience. And, of course, it means engaging in intellectually rarefied activities that take the opposing theories and philosophies seriously while putting forward our own as compellingly as possible and at as high a level as possible. Now, the reason I think this Gramscian notion that you brought up is so important uh, is because what Gramsci refers to when he talks about hegemony uh, is a lot more than just power, right? Uh, It's really about the kind of imagination people have about what is politically achievable at any given time. Right. Uh, And that is very much set by power, but it also contributes to the perpetuation of power. Since if people can't imagine an alternative, then they're not going to agitate against the structures uh, that impose themselves upon us. Right. Uh, And for a long time, uh, Margaret Thatcher's dictum that there is no alternative to the neoliberal status quo was hegemonic. Right. Uh, It created a kind of mindset that people found it very difficult to struggle against. Uh, And we've been trying to break out of that. I think to a certain degree successfully for the last 40 years. Uh, Now, since we've achieved a kind of break in neoliberal hegemony, 
Uh, this has opened the door certainly to advocate for more progressive and inclusive and egalitarian forms of liberalism, which is what I want to see. Uh, but it also has opened the door for these new kinds of reactionary politics to enter in and say, if we're going to be questioning certain kind of neoliberal dogmas, why not move in this right wing direction instead? Uh, and this is why there's a lot of risks and opportunities at the current moment. Uh, and I have no idea uh, what way things are going to go. Right? But understanding the Gramscian dynamics that you were talking about, I think, is so central to grasping the period in which we live. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm glad. I, I sort of thought you would, uh, uh, everything you write, I think, tends in this direction. So I sort of thought you would, you would also uh, resonate with that, right? And, and I think, I, 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 in general, find these, this gets at also, you know, even, even more um, moderate members of both, uh, you know, even the, the Democratic Party, or even sort of like never Trumpers who look at the culture war people who are still committed to preserving democracy and they say well this like you said this stuff is a sideshow or a distraction or um isn't it so isn't it just an example of how kind of um um i think i think they would even argue sort of how kind of impotent and sort of directionalist the trump movement is and when i hear that i go no 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 like this is this is every like if, if we're not willing to to really see right the sort of the the as silly as it sounds right they've have there's that clip that's been going around recently right of DeSantis saying the word woke like I don't know something like seven or ten times in like thirty <laughs> seconds yeah. you know it, it, there there's a way you can present that that's completely farcical and 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 obviously politics often can be farcical while also being menacing right. Um, you know, there's there's a way you could do it. And I think, you know, I look at that and I go, no, no, no. Like I I can't shut up about um, you know, when I write something for ARC or whatever else, I find that I inevitably keep coming back to um the, the, the transgender issue, the uh the sort of um general sort of malice towards quote unquote wokeness, because the cultural war is not a sideshow. It is in many ways, right? The the center ring, um, and I don't know. You could. I'm curious if you, you know, this is this is sort of picking up and pushing a little further than where we just were. I know you you had a, a really great uh, response just then to my question about about Gramsci and and uh, you know strategic position and culture. But I'm curious if you think that is an overstatement because to me, I think that the culture war is at this point. It kind of, you know, I mean, I don't think that it means we don't have to be alarmed by economic inequality. I'm alarmed by inequality. I'm alarmed by the lack of adequate housing for people. I'm alarmed by the climate crisis. But this cultural fight to me feels so fundamentally central that if I if we don't find a way through that thicket, I, I don't know how we resolve some of these other problems. Absolutely. Uh, so I think there's, again... Much to be said here. Uh, so I'm going to make two points, a normative point and a descriptive point. Uh, the normative point that I'll make is that I think that Nancy Love is absolutely correct that the failure of earlier socialist movements lay in being able to reconcile the demand for economic equality and economic justice with the demands for other kinds of group inclusion that were equally important, but were sidelined uh, by many radical groups, particularly those dominated by white men. This includes achieving quality for people of color, achieving quality for queer individuals, achieving quality for women. Uh, those are not secondary struggles, right? Uh, and finding a way to align all of these together has been a long-term task uh, for the left. And I think we made a lot of progress in that, not least through Fraser's work uh, and people like Wendy Brown, uh, but there's more to be said about it. Uh, and I don't want us to regress back uh, to this, again, vulgar Marxist position that the only thing that we can, should be concerned about are bread and butter issues uh, and these kinds of demands for cultural inclusion, acceptance or recognition, if you want to use that language, uh, aren't important. Right. Uh, I don't think that that is viable strategically and I don't think it is morally acceptable. Right? Uh, in terms of what the central struggle is descriptively, uh, there I am less certain Right. Uh, I mean, I intervene in culture war politics all the time. So I like to think uh, that it's central and that it's making a difference. Right. Uh, but I'm enough of a kind of Marxist social theorist to argue that society is a totality. Right. Uh, defined by many interlocking parts. 
uh, one shouldn't privilege any aspect of that totality over any other, uh, which is why I reject various forms of Volcker Marxism that say, you know, there's a base in the superstructure. Uh, and so is it the case that culture is determinative of, so let's say, economic relations domestically or globally? Uh, or is it the case that culture is determinative of forms of political power that are organized? Well, maybe in some instances, but there's a feedback loop there, right? Uh, so I'm just not sure, to be honest with you, about that, right? Uh, I would say, though, that in some respects, it doesn't really matter what is the most central part of the struggle. Uh, we all have our role to play, and I think that as progressives or liberals, one should just think about what role one can play most effectively. And if that's engaging in culture war politics, then by all means do that. Because uh, I think another mistake that people tend to make is assuming that if there is a kind of central part to politics, then we should be focusing all our energies on that and ignoring the rest of the politics that are operating at different levels of the totality. Right? And I think that that's just a strategic error. Um, what this makes me think of when we're talking about politics in this way, and I take your point um, about not overemphasizing a particular element, is it also makes me think about scale and one of the things that has become weird in the moment we live in, which is uh, politics has always happened, you know, at, at at the national level, at the state level, and, you know, obviously at the local level, right? The adage that all politics is local, which may or may not yeah. apply, right? Uh, in a lot of races today. But what's interesting to me there is how would you, how do you think about bringing some of this thinking down into some of these new challenges that have emerged where um, local politics has become uh, in many places quite corrosive and confrontational. Obviously there's the injection of conspiracy th thinking, but also just, just really combative in a way that there's always that potential with people who are who are you know living down the street from one another for for emotions to run high, but but in a way that has not typically defined right. We're not we're not I think as used to seeing constant sort of news stories about school board fights and screaming matches at local city councils. I mean, um, and and not just that, but but decisions taken at the local level that feel so um, out of order in terms of their their political scale and in terms of their uh uh place in the broader kind of political uh uh fights and, and framework uh, so i'm curious how you think about you know in retaining that sense of the totality um of politics not overemphasizing one aspect of politics over another, but bringing it down to these very intimate places where in a lot of ways it feels like American politics is 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 breaking down um, kind of in real time where we can really observe it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that this is something um, not just progressives, but political scientists have ignored uh, for quite a long time, academic political scientists, because uh, the reality is that local politics just isn't usually very sexy, right? Uh, it tends to be of interest to people at the local level and to no one else. Uh, and that's a serious mistake, right? So I, there's a few things I'll say about this, one positive and one negative. I think that progressives ignore the viability uh, of achievements at local politics uh, at their peril. And I'll give two examples of this. Uh, so, so for instance, at the peak of the democratic socialist movement in the early 20th century, uh, one of the reasons it became increasingly popular in the United States was because there were a few democratic socialist mayoralties, uh, and they were casticated by the newspapers, the so-called sewer socialists in St. Louis, for example, uh, because they were very concerned with building operative sewer systems uh, that were available to all. Uh, and many socialists proudly uh, assumed that label, saying, yes, we're concerned with building workable sewers for the entire public. What is so wrong about that? Why should we be focusing exclusively on sewage uh, for the upper orders while ignoring the fact that allowing sewage to run through the streets of the lower classes is bad for everyone, right? Uh, and this helped them win an awful lot of popularity because socialists were considered the ones who genuinely showed concern for municipal issues to the extent their rivals didn't, right? Or if you want a more contemporary example, think about somebody like Bernie Sanders, right? Uh, Bernie Sanders famously started off as the mayor of a pretty small city, uh, but despite being relentlessly attacked by 
any number of different figures on the right end in the center, uh, he was considered to be a pretty good mayor. Uh, he learned how to do grassroots organizing there. Uh, he was widely popular with the electorate and they couldn't get rid of him because uh, it looked like he was doing a good job, which is ultimately the. Well, I want to real quick as you're as just to add to your thoughts, right? This is something even more recently, right? Where, uh, uh, in addition to his age, regardless of of how people, you know, when this was just opportunistic, plenty of his fellow Democrats in the primary attacked Pete Buttigieg as a kind of, well, how how can you think you have a, a an insight into how to be president? All you've done is be a mayor. Yeah, exactly, and I think that's very silly, right? I mean, think about local levels, right? Um, oftentimes, local politics is what has a more immediate impact on the lives of people than federal or state politics, uh, right? If you can catch a bus to go to work. Uh, and you don't have money for a car, uh, that's pretty impactful. Uh, and if there's no bus system, then you're screwed in a lot of ways, right? Uh, but this is why I think, you know, Sanders really benefited uh, from spending a lot of time as mayor of a small city because he learned the ropes of politics. He was able to deliver to his constituents. He showed how left-wing policies can actually make people's lives better. And that's the way that you convince people in a lot of ways. Proof of concept, right? Uh, now, the other thing that I think is important is a lot more sinister, uh, and it's that a lot of us were very little concerned with the actual local mechanics of American democracy until recently, right? Uh, particularly when it came to things like um, signing off uh, on local elections uh, at the federal level. Uh, and this is the kind of boring machinery of federal elections uh, that all but a few political scientists um, thought was important. I'm oh, sorry, only a few political scientists uh, who are really wonkish thought was important. But recently we've seen the sustained Republican attack on the local machinery of federal elections to try to make sure that they can appoint potential conspiracy theorists who will overturn the results of local elections in order to try to influence who's going to win the federal election, right? Uh, and this has required a lot of us to pay a lot more attention uh, to the kinds of people and to the kind of processes that none of us thought we had to pay attention to. Uh, because Steve Bannon is absolutely right that this was kind of the Achilles heel of the entire system, uh, because it's where very little attention was being paid by liberals or progressives. Uh, and so that's where you can start to infiltrate. Uh, and I think we need to pay a lot more attention uh, to these kinds of issues. And fortunately, we have, uh, but there's still a lot more work to be done there. So that's the kind of negative side. So again, it's important to recognize that while paying attention to the local level and succeeding at the local level is a really good way of proving the viability of progressive politics. It's also the case that local politics can be an Achilles heel uh, for American democracy, as been, has been shown, which is why we need to be more attentive uh, to the dynamics of what's going on there. I think that's honestly, to me, an excellent place to pivot with you to our, our tracker question that we like to ask here on the periphery, which is, uh, we love to ask people, and you're, you're Canadian, um, yeah. and uh, we love to ask people if they're going back to your neck of the woods. Um, and what part of Canada are are you from? Uh, so I grew up in Stittsville, Ontario. It's a little place near Ottawa, uh, but I also did my PhD at Toronto. You know, since okay. it's uh, what we like to call the center of the universe, right? Eventually, everybody makes their way there, at least for a little while. Okay. Well, if someone's out, um, particularly like where you grew up in Canada, we like to we like to ask people, you know, anything, right? Um, bar, restaurant, state park, uh, hole in the wall, uh, record store that you love, whatever it is that you think they should check out in the spirit of sending people off the most sort of well-trodden pathways, sending people to places where uh, or recommending places where people maybe don't go as much. Uh, if someone makes their way all the way up to central Ontario. What do you think? Uh, what What's your sort of, this is the thing you got to do if you want to have a cool experience? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, so in terms of a good bookstore, I'd recommend Octopus Books uh, in Ottawa, right? Uh, it's a great little radical bookstore near Carleton University in the Glebe. Uh, it's uh, privately owned, or sorry, uh, small business, right? Uh, and they do a lot of cool events there, and they usually have free cookies that you can get when you go in there. So that's fun. Uh, in terms of restaurants or bars, God, there's so many in Ottawa uh, that I went to that I like. 
Uh, I would really recommend Darcy McGee's if you're willing to spend a bit of money. Uh, it's a bit of a cliche choice, but it's a really old bar uh, in the oldest part of Ottawa. And it's got a little bit of history because there was a shooting that took place there. They've also got pretty dynamite food and a pretty robust uh, beer selection. Uh, the other place that I'd recommend that's a little bit less well-known, unless you're an Ottawa native, would be Pub Italia. Because uh, Pub Italia has something like 800 beers uh, on their menu and pretty decent Italian food. It's a bit more off the beaten track. Like you need to walk down Somerset for a couple of hours. But believe me, it's uh, worth it. And the staff there are usually really nice. Uh, and like I said, the food's good. Uh, in terms of Toronto, uh, definitely a bit more of a known place. Uh, but there's a few things uh, that I can recommend. If people do wind up going to Toronto, um, the locals will tell you that if you're interested in buying books, go to the BMV. Uh, don't go to the Indigo or any of the big bookstores. So BMV is kind of a Toronto treasure uh, where it's a chain of used bookstores. Uh, and it's where a lot of academics, artists, and um, you know hipster types like to dump <laughs> their excess books. Uh, so you can usually go and pick up all kinds of neat stuff there for you know sometimes four or five bucks, uh, which is pretty good. Uh, and they serve coffee also, so that's nice. In terms of bars, I did my PhD at in Toronto, so there's so many of them, unfortunately. Uh, there's a few. Um, few, few, few. The Rose and Crown is where I would usually go, but that's cheap, and it's not a particularly good bar, so I wouldn't recommend that one. Um, let me think. Think. Oh, Sneaky D's. Yeah, so Sneaky D's is a Mexican-ish bar uh, in Toronto. It's usually really popular because uh, they've got dynamite Mexican food and they're open pretty late and they've got cheap tequila. Uh, but it's also a really unique experience. If you go in, they've got like all this kind of skull memorabilia around uh, and this really kind of cool punk imagery and stuff. So that would definitely be a place uh, that I'd go. Uh, but get there early. Like if you're a, a night person and you like to go to bars uh, later in the evening, try to show up around nine o'clock or you won't be able to get a table. Uh, man, those are some great recommendations. I, you know, I've never been to Ontario. I've been to the Maritime Provinces. I've been yeah. to BC, and I've also been out to uh, Nova Scotia and Prince Edward Island in, in New Brunswick. Uh, but uh, I have, I do really want to go to Toronto because during the pandemic, I started yeah. um, all the way back with the original um, '80s show, watching the entire because uh, I'd never seen it before, watching all of Degrassi. So start with uh, <laughs> yeah. Degrassi yeah. Junior High, uh, and I'm now I'm now like uh, I think like six seasons into uh, the Next Generation, obviously with with uh, Drake and and all those people. But um, of course, that was the that was the like one of the big pandemic things I started doing with uh, my best friend who lives in Austin. He had who had watched it all, and so he. Uh, uh, um, my, my wife and I uh, would would get on uh, with him uh, and remotely watch uh, uh, Degrassi in, in in marathon sessions. So I'm now I'm now nearly through, which makes me feel like I need to go to Toronto. Uh, anytime I tell a Canadian that I've been watching through all of Degrassi, including the like really old original run, they're usually a little uh, they get nostalgic. <laughs> oh yeah, totally. I mean that show along with like Trailer Park Boys. Pretty much to find, uh, you know, my teenagehood. So absolutely, right? Uh, and it'd be, look, Toronto's a great place. Uh, I really like it. Uh, it's expensive as all fucking hell. So if you're not a millionaire, you gotta got to know where to go in order to get the most from it. Uh, but, you know, the multicultural vibe, the really pretty urban spaces, uh, and the fact that you can get pretty much just any kind of food or beer that you want from all around the world uh, is pretty great. Um in terms of like Ottawa, like the Ottawa area where I grew up, uh, it's a little bit smaller uh, and a little bit more kind of waspy. Uh, but there's all kinds of cool stuff that you can do there also. I mean, if you go to Ottawa, the other thing to try is um, Quebecois cuisine, uh, since it's not too far from the French border or the Quebec uh, border. So you can find all kinds of little like French bistros and stuff that are really nice. So uh, and those actually aren't even all that expensive. Um, the other thing to do if you get to Ottawa is... You won't quite get the same experiences if you go to Montreal, but you should try uh, a Montreal smoked meat sandwich, right? Um, if you're not vegan or vegetarian, because it's a pretty much a, a quintessential Canadian classic and it's really good. I I, I appreciate, I always appreciate uh, local food wrecks. Um, Matt McManus, thank you so much for being on the podcast. 
No problem. Thanks a lot for having me. And uh, yeah, it was a lot of fun. Take care of yourself. All right. The Periphery is a production of the Pulaski Institution. I've been your host, Alan Elrod. Our music was written, recorded, and produced by Brandon Ragsdale and Cody Smith. Thank you for coming, and please join us next time.